Good morning. My name is Lance French. I'm the business development manager for w and Enviro Environmental, a division of Braun Intertech, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar on Petro development and dredging. We're going to be talking about permitting challenges. Our expert panel for today are Andy Adams, Sally Perry, and I sit in Austin Hyder. Thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, before we get started, before we get started, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions, please send them uh, to me through your question tab on your GoToWebinar window. If we don't get to your questions, I will make sure that uh, they see them and we'll get an answer for you as soon as possible. We are recording this webinar and it will be available to rewatch on our website soon along with the slides and you'll receive an email with the link when they're made available. We are still practicing shelter in place, so we're all in separate locations. Uh, so there could be a dog bark, a baby crying, maybe a lawnmower and Lord, let's hope not a doorbell because my Shih Tzu will go crazy and we might have to shut the whole thing down. So, but uh, let's introduce you to our panel. Sorry, Andy Adams, he's a vice president and principal scientist. Um, he's environmental program management advocate and sales and sales office in Houston. He has 17 years of environmental consulting and you can see all his impressive uh, degrees and letters there with period. So congratulations on all the success, Andy. <laughs> Thanks, Lance. It just means I'm old. <laughs> Did I skip one? Nope. Um, Austin Heider, he's our uh, director and senior scientist um, investigation remediation, and he is also um, officed in Houston. He has a BS in environmental geoscience from Texas A&M University, and he is the only Aggie that we have on the panel today. So Andy, thank you, or Austin, thank you for uh, being with us. Thanks, Lance, not a problem. <laughs> and with us again, uh, Sally Perry, she's a group manager and sen senior scientist of Compliance and Permitting Office in Houston, and she has a BS in Earth Systems minor in Biological Science from Stanford University, and she has 13 years of experience. And uh, Sally, isn't this like the second one in a row for you? Yeah. Wow. Let's not make this habit. Just kidding. Yeah. Back by popular demand. Yeah. <laughs> the marketing department must Those have fans out there. Yeah. So, so okay, we're gonna uh, so we're gonna get to sorry. Um, here's an overview of, of what our webinar is going to be over today. So, Andy or Sally, you want to take over here from here? Yep. So, what we wanted to do today was, you know, we talked a little bit just about dredging to start with, and we decided that there is a lot more to this picture than just dredging, and we wanted to try and give you a little bit fuller of a vision of how all of this fits together at some point, because it's not just dredging, it's not just phase ones and twos, it's not just permitting and compliance. Most of these sites that need this are, are you know, integrated, huge facilities that need all of it multiple times in their lifetime. So um, we wanted to give you a more holistic view. And so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna and and hang with us. We're gonna we're gonna start with some basics that a lot of you are already gonna know, and then we'll get into the the meat and potatoes. But for those that don't all know it, um, we want to give you some background. So we're gonna start with some some site history. We'll go through some planning and surveys, look at some permitting. Then we'll get into the meat of the dredging and negotiation on dredging and what what things really matter or what things you can really influence. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about city and community involvement. Maybe that's sometimes overlooked. And, and through this, we're gonna touch on some of our engineering and testing services that none of the three of the experts on the, on the line are true experts in, but we can steer you to the right places if you have questions on those things. So looking big picture <clears throat> at the 30,000 foot level, these are, you know, big businesses of petroleum refining, petrochemical refining, petrochemical facilities, chemical facilities, and they have become easier to build because of the huge amount of natural gas that is being unleashed from, from activities in, in the oil and gas field. And 
it makes these things able to go on a different accounting method or dollar method now with the fuel uh, that you can have at costs that are existing and so and future costs as well so building that infrastructure and navigating the the environmental cascades of regulation it's complex but it's becoming um, easier to do because of the dollar side of gas and so what it's done actually is created a, a fairly big need for advanced compliance permitting investigation and due diligence because of where these sites sit for a big part of it they they sit um, in areas that um, have existing infrastructure in places that don't. They sit in places that have existing impacts in some cases, and then you mix in federal waterways and wetlands and, and threatened endangered species and and storm water at you know 50 or 60 inches a year, and all of a sudden you have a recipe for a lot of moving parts. Uh, so as we get into the, the next slide here, we're going to start at the beginning. <laughs> where do you where do you pick one of these things? How do you pick it? Um, and so we're gonna we're gonna rely on some each other's strengths here. And, and I'm gonna let Austin jump in and chat some about site selection and and histories and and all the things that start to go into that kind of decision. Yeah, and Andy, you, you mentioned it, Lo location, 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 right? You've talked about areas uh, of heavy development, uh, potentially undeveloped areas, but when we're considering planning and deciding on where these facilities may be, be uh, developed, we, we have to consider proximity to rivers, ship channels, um, federal channels. W what is the surrounding community? Are we in a mixed use area? Is there heavy commercial and industrial? Uh, are there are residential neighborhoods? Uh, are there sensitive receptors? Is there nearby school, uh, nearby daycare? Um, what is the perception going to be of this development? And and Andy and and talked about it initially about uh, community involvement. So uh, a ton of things go into the decision making process for for where we develop. And site history is extremely important. Um, location and proximity to other uh, heavy industrial facilities is important and a part of that is the due diligence process uh, phase one environmental site assessments uh, those are typically performed obviously for property transactions or development of um, a vacant property and so we want to get an idea of what the site's history is not only the current operations but historical operations dating back as far as that we can recover information so we look at things like interpreting aerial photographs um, from 1920s to current date. We look at topographic maps. We look at Sanborn maps. Um, not just are we focusing on the, the actual property that's going to be developed, but we're focusing on the surrounding properties. How may they impact uh, the site itself from an environmental standpoint? Are there historic spills? Are we talking a, a petrochemical facility that's been operating for 19, uh, 19 from 1940s to the current date um you know we, we try and build the the whole picture uh and use as much environmental information that we have we we perform environmental <laughs> database reviews um we perform perform owner interviews the current owner try and identify previous owners to talk about the operations what they stored at those facilities what type of operations were there so we can really focus on uh what potential recognized environmental concerns or conditions we might have relating to the site. And um, you know, there's the phase one process is non-intrusive. We take a look at it just from a, not necessarily a desktop review. We go out, we look at the site, um, but we're also doing a lot of state and regulatory review of, of database registrations um, and site cleanups. So if we find some recognized environmental conditions on the site, or surrounding uh, properties, we, we want to further investigate that and we perform an intrusive investigation, which is the phase two environmental site assessment. Uh, that's basically driven by the potential environmental impacts of certain media. Uh, we could be looking at soil, we could be looking at groundwater, sediment, vapor, surface water, 
Um, it's all dependent on the results of that phase one environmental side assessment. And so, um, you know, th those phase two investigations are strictly driven based off of historic operations. We define the chemicals of concern that we may investigate, go out, we install soil borings, uh, collect soil samples, install monitoring wells, get an idea for groundwater gradient, and kind of see if there are impacts related to site operations or potential adjacent operations. Um, from there, we, we, we look at remediation strategy if it's required. Do, do we have impacts? Where are they? Are they delineated horizontally and vertically? Um, are they defined on the site? Do they move off site? And so we implement either risk-based assessments or physical uh, controls to remove source areas, source impacts, um, and hopefully move a site towards closure to where we can uh, further develop on that property. Um, and, and we'll go back, there you go, one more thing, sorry. Uh, land use. Um, what's important, like we, we talked about, we look at previous land use, we look at current land use, and we want to think about the future land use of the property. Um, why is this important? Because there could be some sort of limitations with development on a property. Um, let's say a site we're purchasing has some history, it, it is closed through a state, um, state program, but there's either a commercial industrial deed restriction uh, for development. It can't have residential, can only have commercial development on it. Uh, is there potentially a restricted covenant, a restrictive covenant from the underlying soil and groundwater conditions? Um, is there potentially a municipal setting designation that's restricting um, groundwater use at the site? Those can affect the development of the property in a number of ways. If we're looking at water source, um, depending on the location of this, this, this facility that's going to be developed, if we're not able to connect to the city's water supply, we, we've got to look at a private water supply. If there's a restriction on groundwater at the site, that could pose a potential problem. Um, at the same time, during the development phase of, of the property, we may come into contact with impacted soils or groundwaters and have to manage those in a certain way, a certain way because that could pose a, a potential human health exposure. So we, we want to look at uh, you know, the, the site as a whole, the, adja the adjacent properties as a whole to make sure we're covering our basis uh, from an environmental standpoint. Well, and often it's it's really the land use gets into a really bigger picture item, right? It, it's who's around, what can you do on it, what might you be able to do if you play your cards right. Um, but it also can play into how you deal with spoils and things like that. And that's just a little teaser. We can get into that more as we go, but it, it's really a matrix kind of thing, right? It's not just a one, one issue. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You're, you're right. We're just, uh, we're dipping our toes in the sand right now and, and going to build the picture, but absolutely. Right. So then along with the, site history, and part of that really is looking at um, the cultural and natural resources potentially present on the site that you might be looking at or the multiple sites that you're evaluating for, for siting of a new facility. So we call that environmental planning and surveys. And we might start off with what we would call a desktop evaluation where we're just looking at different publicly available databases and um, topographic maps, um, aerial imagery, historic aerial imagery, um, and looking to see if we can find anything of note there that might be pertinent for development of the site, and in particular, these items here. So in the desktop evaluation, we look for wetlands um, with something like an NWI database. We'd also um, check some databases to see if there are any threatened and endangered species of note in that known to be found in that region. Um, are there any potential historic sites, cultural sites in that area? Um, what does the drainage look like in the topographic map currently? Um, and then are there any floodplains? So the desktop evaluation can provide a really high level cursory review of all these items. And depending on what's found there, you can dig deeper. Of course, you could skip the desktop evaluation altogether, but it gives you a high level sense of what might be present at the site that you'd want to consider. And a lot of these items are a little bit more pertinent for greenfield development, something that's never been developed in the past, or um, 
an older site that had been developed years ago that's maybe been overgrown. And there might now be wetlands present, allowed to grow back, um, and um, different species that might be threatened or endangered that have moved into the site. So we would want to perform boots on the ground surveys, such as a wetland delineation, to determine if, in fact, the wetlands that maybe the database indicated were present are, are actually real wetlands, um, and delineate the extent of, of those wetlands. Um, which have ramifications later on if there are wetlands present. So permitting would be required if you're going to impact those wetlands or waters, if you're going to remove or place material in a wetland. Permitting and even mitigation would be required, which has um, some time ramifications there, along with significant cost ramifications for um, mitigating that destruction or filling of the wetlands or waters. Um, threat endangered species survey, generic ones can be done, but we might determine that more specific ones need to be performed, such as like a bird survey for a particular bird, um, mussels if it's water work there along the Gulf Coast, um, toad surveys are another one. And a lot of these are also seasonal, so that's another consideration. Maybe it's, um, you know, nesting season for a particular bird, and that would need to be taken into consideration for the construction time frame. Um, cultural survey would be looking for any historic buildings or grave sites or the like, which um, would have another process behind that that would impact the construction timeline as well. Um, the drainage study and design would come into play with a local permitting that I'll talk about here in a little bit, but that's um, an additional need to do some modeling potentially if you're planning on increasing the impervious structures at the site, which most facilities are going to have tanks and concrete and asphalt and such that would change the drainage around the site and have some downstream impacts and potentially flood out your neighbors, which is something that your local permitting authority or city or your county would not be, would not allow. And this would require significant um, hydraulic evaluations and can take some time and effort to complete. And it becomes even worse and more complicated if your project site is in a floodplain floodplain permitting would come into effect as well, which would be managed by your local authority, but really ultimately FEMA is doing that. Well, and it's really one of those important things to maybe plan ahead on yeah. when you're considering, is your stormwater going to go to a retention pond? Mm -hmm. Should it? Should you have a wastewater treatment plant that's capable of treating some of that right. along with it. Yeah, so all these things, all these pieces of information will help you first decide if you're going to build on the site, and then if you are, if you choose to purchase, acquire that property or utilize that property, what will you be required to construct and design to manage these issues? Do you need yeah, a detention pond, a retention pond, um, if you're going to be changing the drainage? of the site, which you most likely will. Um, and is there a way that if you do determine there are wetlands, can you avoid them? Can you keep them intact and keep them away from your operations and not have to disturb them at all? Um, and, you know, seasonal issues with species as well. Um, when you can build and when you can't build, right. depending on what's on the site. Right? Yeah, so these are more construction-related topics. Um, prior to construction, all these things would need to be evaluated uh, and not so much once operation commences, but still things to consider. So then once all those surveys are completed and all of your due diligence has been performed, you understand the site history, then you'd probably want to start looking into permitting because a lot of these items not only have a lead time, it, that's required to or needed in order to obtain a permit to construct or to operate. Um, but some of these items might ultimately change the design of your facility. So air permitting is always a big one. 
especially for larger facilities, because that permitting process takes time. It takes time to develop the permit itself, the application. But ultimately, it might lead to different decisions and restrictions of your operations of your site, depending on what your emissions are, what permit mechanism you're going to, or authorization mechanism you're going to be able to utilize. And it might end up changing your overall plans of the site and your throughput. And by that, I mean, we might find that as a result of some air modeling that's required by your site that certain pieces of equipment are too close to sensitive receptors. Um, again, depending on the permitting mechanism, your permitting mechanism might also depict that you're too close to a sensitive receptor. Um, the modeling, again, could show that nearby structures or facilities are within a certain distance that you do not pass modeling and you cannot have your sources in those locations, in which case you need to change the location of something. You need to increase the stack height of a flare or an engine and you end up playing a little bit of a game with the modeling on where you can place your sources at your site. So you'd want to start that permitting process early on, at least a year in advance, to make sure that you understand where everything can be placed on site and you can start construction when you wish to. Um, water is another big topic and that can mean a lot of different things really, just very broad category, um, depending on where your site is as well. So you might find that you need drinking water, that you are not close to the city's water source, for example, and you need to provide your own public water system, which has permitting ramifications there, along with general compliance and testing requirements throughout the year, um, and different issues with wells that you might put in at your site, such as subsidence, things to consider. Um, maybe your process also will require a large amount of water in it to just perform your normal operations, in which case you might need to consider water rights. Can you obtain that water from the city? Is that too costly? Can you get water rights to take water from the ship channel, for example, if you're located there, looking to be located there? Um, that water that you're using in your process what happens when it's quote unquote spent? Do you treat it on site and discharge it to a local MS4, municipal separate stormwater system? Do you discharge it to a private wastewater treatment facility? Do you discharge it or do you want to discharge it to a state waters? All those different options have different permitting paths with those um, local authorities or with Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and can take up to a year sometimes to get all the data right to understand if it's safe for you to send your wastewater to that facility or to discharge it to the waters of the state. Um, stormwater and is another piece of the puzzle, mostly for construction purposes. It's the construction general permit. Um, pretty straightforward, basic to obtain the construction general permit itself but you still are going to be required to set up best management practices to ensure that sediment generated during construction um, is not discharged offsite and have someone check throughout the duration of the construction to ensure that those BMPs are standing or that they're modified as necessary. Um, another piece to the puzzle, local permitting. And it's called different things depending on where your site will be located. Um, some call it a building permit, some call it site development permits, and that would be through wherever, again, the jurisdiction that you're located in. So is it a city? Are you inside the city limits? If you're outside the city limits, is it the county or is there some sort of jur additional jurisdiction that you need to look to here along the ship channel, the port authority, or some sort of port area, you might, the port authority might be your governing body there, in which case you have to apply for a permit to um, disturb a site. Well, and don't forget, some of those have, I, it's a stretch to call them a dredging permit, but some of them have their own fees that you need to fill out of papers oh, to show that you have the Corps' approval to yeah. do anything and yep. pay your fee. Yeah, they're going to ask you all those things 
based on what you're doing, based on what you represent in your application, and they're going to want to see stamp engineering drawings showing these things, demonstrating that you're not um, going to be doing anything improperly, that everything's hooked up properly, the electrical is in place, you're not going to cause a problem with traffic, that you're not going to cause drainage issues downstream, um, and that you're covered with your stormwater in some fashion. So you'd just demonstrate that you are getting authorization through TCEQ for those activities, but it, it can be a long process and, you know, working with the government isn't always speedy. So that ends up being a tipping point there is making sure you get local permitting approval to construct. Um, as part of that, there's a floodplain review, but it's a, a big important piece of it. Again, can you avoid the floodplain in any way, shape, or form? Um, it's just highly frowned upon, but it happens occasionally. And I think locally in, in Harris County, in the city of Houston, you know, where we are located, uh, they're almost not approving any construction within floodplains right now after Harvey. So things to consider. Uh, Army Corps of Engineers permitting, like I mentioned before, after you perform any wetland delineation and you determine that you, in fact, need to remove or place material in a wetlands or a waters, then you're going to need a permit with the Corps. If you're going to be doing dredging and sediment is going to be discharged into a water, then you're going to need that permit. So pieces to consider might not take an incredible amount of time, but it could take up to a year again. So all of these pieces sometimes have year-long lead times that are required. And you might get some feedback from these agencies, such as the Corps, stating that they're, they're not happy with the way that you're doing it, and you might need to make some tweaks. DLO also comes into play depending on what you're, where you're located and what you're looking to disturb. If you're going to be building something in their property, then you'll have to get authorization from them. And then in the future, if you're planning on storing any oils, if you're in within their jurisdiction, they also require registration there and they will inspect you or other, annually. Or other state agency, depending on where you're located. There yeah, are. This is, um, GLO is, is everywhere, but um, depending again on where exactly you're located, who your local permit authority is. Again, we're in Texas, so TCEQ is um, going to be over your air and your water permitting. Would, um, Sal, you said TCEQ, but the, and that's just in, that's only in Texas. So the other states that are listening, yep. they're going to have their own authority mm -hmm. that that they need to get their their approvals from as well, or their oversight. Correct. Yep. And many of them will have, so in Texas, it's a general land office, GLO. Many of them will have a separate agency statewide for that entity as well. And it's called a number of different things, but um, same difference. There's usually a state arm that operates the environmental side, and then there's usually a state arm that operates state lands or other jurisdictions. Yeah, and then pretty unique, but comes into play depending on your operation and your funding. But NEPA is another piece that is more for federally funded or federal property, which you know we deal with on occasion, and it's just a longer process that includes all these things, but in a regimented formal way. And FERC, again, its own special side of the world, and that deals with the Natural Gas Act, but that's if your project is planning on transporting natural gas across state lines, so fairly specific, but a long regimented formal process. Another piece to consider depending on um, what your project is doing. Um, bottom line with all this permitting, long lead times, year to year and a half sometimes, sometimes two years, depending on if you get any public feedback on some of these items, which we'll talk about later. Um, but a lot of interaction with these respective agencies, and the earlier you do it, the better. And, and also, the earlier you have an idea of what you want to do, the better. That way we can 
talk with these agencies, let them know what you're doing specifically, and find the best, fastest path forward. Yeah. All right, meat and potatoes time. So, when we look at dredging, and this is where you get these big sites on waterways and people want to build docks or inlets or bulkheads or weep walls. Um, I mean, I, there's, there's a million different things. But so where we really start at with this is 404 permitting or Clean Water Act permitting Basis, basically establishes a program to regulate the discharge of dredge or fill material into waters of the United States. And so it gives the United States Army Corps that oversight power to issue permits for that. And so I want to I want to cut through that a little. Their job ultimately here is to regulate what gets opened up to US or to waters of the United States. Which by the way, if anybody's checking, that definition changed yesterday or the day before in the Federal Registry for final output in a couple months. Um, and it's changed before and now it's changing back a little bit and you know, whatever. Most most of these are pretty clear from the onset that they that they fall into this. Um, it's pretty hard to be very far from the waters of the U.S. So um, the Corps has the power to oversee those dredging permits, and that's how we start in this dredging process. Uh, the other one is Section 10 of the Rivers and Harbors Act. And so Section 10 is a create, so it bars the creation of obstacles or obstruction not firmly authorized by Congress to the navigable capacity of any waters of the United States. And so you're probably going, what, what the hell does that mean? So I think in, immediately it was for dams and other things like that, but more importantly today maybe, it's about not getting in the way of breakwaters and harbors and not artificially changing um, the current makeup of the shoreline and that includes natural shoreline but it also then includes the bulkheads that already exist the docks the wharfs the the dolphin the booms the weirs the breakwaters the bulkheads the jetties all kinds of stuff falls in under this and they have this power on waters of the u.s and harbors in ports and a number of other things and so really i'm telling you all that to bring it back together to talk about, um, you know, specifically those dredging permits for that stuff. The reason they have those powers is to protect against those things, meaning dredge materials going all over or obstruction of waterways or other such things. Um, and so I'm just going to touch really softly on placement considerations because we're going to get into placement considerations a lot in the next couple slides but this is one of the central drivers of how you dredge where you dredge why we sample what we sample for where we sample and it is a big driver of cost um, where you can go with these to, to place the dredge sports, um, you know, the, and there are seven or eight of these things, and they some are open to private companies, some are only open to government. Especially as we enter this new era of bigger ships, many of these areas have been taken up for uh, pretty important things, meaning channel expansion, widening, and deepening, uh, so that those craft can come into ports and 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 estuaries and, and and different harbors and things like that. Which and have been federal projects. Which are absolutely federal projects, which tend to get the federal placement yeah. areas. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there with placement 
but no placement is exceptionally important and it's going to be an iterative process as we go forward with where you can take it based on what you find out and what's open to you to take it for where we could possibly go. And so I'm going to let Austin start talking about some of the considerations as we as we start to bat around. And, and placement isn't a single answer. It's not a today answer. It's figuring out a little bit of info from that phase two that we probably did. What do those samples look like and what might our placement be? What has it been historically? If it's been a settling pond for the last 50 years, then maybe we need to do something different with the top five feet as opposed to something else. But um, let's, let's let Austin get us into to some sampling and analysis plans and considerations there, and then we'll come back more to placement after we understand some of the core's central issues with sampling. And one thing I'll say also, not to forget, just to back up a little bit, is you'll need to perform some sort of bathymetric survey as well. So you know where the bottoms are right now, and you can understand what quantity of material that you'll want to want to remove, ideally, so that you can have your operation constructed as intended. Yeah. It, it, you're you're both right, and so y'all y'all took the first two words out of my mouth with site history and bathymetric survey, but that's all right. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, I, thanks. You you touched it for me. So you know the SAP is a a all inclusive document that touches on a lot of things. Um, we want to note about the site history. Andy mentioned it. We already probably have some phase one and phase two uh, data, or maybe some closure documents with state or federal agencies. We, we want to evaluate that and see if there may be some specific areas at the site that might lie in that dredge, proposed dredge footprint that we might need to focus on a little bit more uh, closely. Um, you know, that footprint has to have a recent bathymetric survey that's been completed in the last two years. It'll show the, the extent, uh, the proposed depths, like, like Sally mentioned. And so having those those things, knowing the size of the footprint, the expected volume of your dredge spoils, um, your objective and plan use for the property are really important to build the story in the SAP. And so um, when we have an idea of the footprint, uh, Andy mentioned we could be looking at, uh, you know, uh, fu future docks or, um, you know, developing a bulkhead. We want to have an idea on what area is going to be what area of dredge spoils is, is planned for removal? And is this a one-year project? Is this a 10-year project? Will really depend on kind of how you propose uh, your sampling plan. Uh, primarily because I'm not going to jump ahead, but timing is extremely important. Sally mentioned that some of these permits can take six months to a year to obtain. Um, and I will tell you that some of this data that we're going to collect is, is on a timeline. So uh, before I get to that, I'll kind of jump into the details of, of what should be included in a SAP. And so we're going to look at uh, required media, which would be soil, sediment, elutriate, uh, and groundwater uh, from the proposed dredge area. And we'll define uh, the proposed locations on a map that's going to be presented in, in the, into the sampling plan to the Corps of Engineers. So we have a number of samples that may be dependent on a predetermined sampling frequency. Um, I will tell you that the sampling frequency is extremely important when you're talking about the development of a large petrochemical facility. Um, the size is a case-by-case -case basis uh, that you typically will, will have pre-meetings with the Corps of Engineers or potentially the private owners of, of those manage, the dredge management placement areas to determine the required number of samples uh, for each media. Um, in addition, you're going to discuss the chemical and physical characteristics of sampling. So. Um, what might have been there historically? Do we know the operations? Are we are we talking VOCs, SVOCs, TPH, dioxins, PCBs, pesticides, metals? All those things are are required uh, for sampling under um, the Green Book, which was established with uh, EPA and Corps of Engineers. It's the ocean testing manual that evaluates dredge material, and so we're going to utilize that Green Book to develop our sampling media and our analysis that we want to plan to evaluate. And I can tell you that 
that uh, these things get pretty pricey. Um, what I've listed, you're talking expensive analytical that takes in the neighborhood of seven to 20 days for turnaround time from the initial submittal to the lab. So time, time is definitely of the es essence um, when we're performing these activities. Um, we also want to perform data validation um, to make sure we have a, we have, um, or able to validate the laboratory data. We want to collect sample duplicates. We want to send trip blanks with submittals of, of samples uh, to make sure um, we can validate our, our parent sample versus a rep duplicated uh, sample. We also want to take equipment blanks. We're use, utilizing a uh, number of pieces of equipment here. You see uh, a Martian buggy rig up in the top right corner, uh, platform mounted CMT on the on the bottom uh, bottom right corner, and then we have, oh goodness, Andy, what's that? I, I'm I'm drawing a blank on the piece of equipment now. It's uh, a it's a CPT uh, rig. No, the, the bottom. Oh, I'm right sorry, there. the Ponar. Ponar, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, that's that sediment sample collection kit there. So um, we're using different types of materials. We want to make sure that we're having a proper decontamination process uh, from collecting each sample in each different location for each media. So um, you know we're going to have uh, standard operating procedures that describe what pieces of equipment are going to be used in what what forms and for conditions, um, how we're going to decontaminate that equipment how we properly store generated waste, whether it's uh, standard PPE that we're utilizing, uh, wash water, um, and, uh, drilling material from soil borings, uh, development water from groundwater, um, all those things play a role in, in preparation of the SAP. And, and so the bottom line uh, of the SAP is, is, is kind of to evaluate what the results say from a chemical and physical standpoint, and where is, are the dredge spoils allowed to go? So Andy briefly touched base on, you know, the considerations for placement and the criteria that we evaluate are, are their target detection limits and screening benchmarks that are established by EPA, dependent on region, uh, also uh, NOAA, dependent on your region, and there, there's specific values that we compare our, our sediment, soil, and nutrient groundwater samples to um, from a marine and an aquatic standpoint, as well as a human health standpoint. And the placement considerations um, will really be driven by this criteria. So where this stuff goes really depends on what we compare our results to. And, and Andy, Andy touched on it. We'll talk a little bit more on the next few slides. Um, but it, it's extremely important because we may end up looking at something that might be considered a waste. If we have a historic activity at the site that either is an old waste management unit, unit, a potential RICRA hazardous storage waste facility, a wastewater treatment basin, and it has some known uh, regulatory closures with state or federal agencies, um, we might be required to provide additional uh, analytical that might be outside the Green Book requirements, um, and we might be looking at potential hazardous or non-hazardous material based off state classification that might actually have to be segregated and go off-site under manifest to a disposal facility. So although there are certain requirements for dredge placement, if that criteria is not met, we may have to look for other options for off-site either recycling or disposal based off that, that classification. Austin, can I jump in quick? Sure. One of, one of the reasons behind that and I think this is important for folks to, on the other side of the fence, to understand. When the core sees waste, and from the TCQ's perspective, whether the concentration is high or low is inconsequential, it's waste. And they can't have that opened up to the federal channel. And so that's where you need to get your arms around what that waste is, um, is the important part of, of that. It, it isn't so much that you that you have it, it's, it's getting it delineated out and getting it dealt with so it isn't a concern for the core or the other agencies. Yeah, absolutely. We, we want to know uh, whether it's a, a placement material or, or if it's a waste. Um, a lot of this can be predetermined um, looking at source areas in the phase two uh, that might have been conducted at the facility if there was one completed. And so um, 
you know, in, in addition to waste, there might be that we have some clean spoils that could be reused on site. So we evaluate that criteria and those results, and, and there might be beneficial reuse for us to actually use that dredge material for placement purposes on the site itself that's going to be developed. Um, timing is timing is important for a number of things. Um, this analytical that is collected and evaluated during this process is either good for two years uh, if it's open water uh, over the channel sampling or up to 10 years if it's upland sampling. So if we're uh, on a property that it, it does not have any standing water, we don't have any surface water, it's adjacent to the to the waterway, whether it's a federal channel, river, stream, and we're performing development of that property, the samples that are collected on the upland uh, portion of a site can be valid for up to 10 years. If we're sampling right on the waterway where we have sediment collection, nutrient collections, those analytical um, laboratory results are only valid for up to two years. And if we're talking petrochemical facilities, these things are not completed in, in a year or two years time. They're typically completed over several phases um, that may result in a total timeline of up to five to 10 years, uh, depending on size and location. So um, you know, I, could, I could go into a ton more detail on the SAP, but, um, you know, I think that kind of wraps the picture together. And Andy, I know we'll probably take it a uh, further step with the placement considerations for that dredge material. Well, and I want to start connecting a couple dots on on that previous slide. So um, the recycling side along with um, the placement side, the more material that we can use at the site, the better off we are. And to Austin's point, the reason you're looking at, they, they make you look at particle size analysis and um, and some of the inorganic anions is so we could get an idea if we could use some of this at a site. And, and you know, that's, a lot of times there's just way too much material and, and I get it, you, you, you need to get rid of it. But meanwhile, where you can reuse this with placement can really influence the dollars spent here. And that relates directly back to that SAP and what you're trying to do. And so now going forward in the, in the next slide, let's really get into placement a little bit here. Um, so, with uh, Lance, we move it to the next slide. So what we end up seeing with placement. So there are, and, and so yes, I know this is a federal project that's illustrated on the right side, but it, it had all the things in it. So it was too easy not to use um, for this illustration. So we have the hardest thing to place, uh, which is ocean dredge material disposal sites or ODIMBIDs or something along those lines. They're few and far between, a few and far between. Um, as you see out in the open ocean, most of that is loggerhead turtle and sargasm protected areas, but there is a small area for open water discharge. And so um, that's one type of placement. Uh, you then see the, the blue areas that um, they are making that are dredge material placement areas. And so those are often federal, but sometimes, so there's one that is a joint effort between Texas City and the GLO in the Houston Galveston Bay District. There are a number of others that are, that are partnerships. Some of those are open for placement and some of them are not. And so those are different than open water. So those have construction around them. They have guards in place to not let sediment move off site. They have different, um, whether it's piers or beams or, or um, sediment shields or all kinds of different things, but you're gonna build an island basically of some type or structure um, and so those also have different exposure, right? Um, open water discharge, you are actively putting all the sediment into aqueous phase, whereas 
going to do a dredge material placement area, you are keeping it quantified. It is becoming terrestrial and you're not opening it up to the actual aquatic system for the most part. So then you have upland placement. So those all those little red areas uh, on the map, those are upland placement areas. And so upland placement is what it implies. Uh, and there's two kinds of upland placement. There is the kind that is regulated under federal or state um, locales, or there is private upland placement, meaning you with that recycled material could go and actually construct yourself an upland placement area on your site and you could place dredge spoils there. That's a whole different exposure pathway because we've now limited it to terrestrial areas uh, and maybe some human contact now because there is access. Um, now, it might be limited access, but there's access nonetheless. So, the last sort of type of placement is permitted landfills and such. And so, most of you know those if you have a waste or if you have high contaminants. So, um, take a place like Chesapeake Bay or, or the Houston Ship Channel where maybe you have dioxin sources or pH sources higher than normal from sites that flood a site regularly. Maybe you have concentrations that just can't go to one of those places. Um, but those are sort of the ideas on different types of placement. So now we get into, is there a clear path to where you take it? And the answer is almost always gonna be no. There's not a clear path. You have to go into the data and you have to segment the data out and you have to move the data around and you have to figure out which of those placement areas is open to you, and then which of those placement areas your analytical support taking it to. And so um, placement matters for testing, and this is an integrated approach, and it's an intuitive approach too. If you don't meet the and so for the most part, open water discharge is not open in most places. And even if it is, your elutrient data that you take has to meet the marine acute exposure scenarios. And so what that really means is we're going to solidify this sample into uh, of sediment with the water that's above it. We're going to pure liquefy it and we're going to shoot it through a pipe and then we're going to spray it out into the aquatic environment. And the reason that they make you look at the marine acute toxicity standard is because you're basically putting all of that impact into the dissolved phase. And so it turns out that the placement that you use greatly matters. And so those standards are very, very low very low, low, way lower than human health standards and everything else. Um, whereas if you decide to take it to an upland placement on your own property, you might be able to use the human health commercial industrial standard for your state or for your EPA region. That could be anywhere from three to four magnitudes higher than those acute marine toxicity um, standards. And so the, the important part here is that your standard comparisons matter and your, your commitments are gonna change to where you wanna take this over time and as you develop more info. Um, and you also need to communicate this effectively. If you're not looking at open water discharge, don't compare things to the marine acute standard and tell the agencies why you're doing that. It may be more important than not doing it. Tell the agency you have no intention of, of using that type of placement. Because in the absence of info, the agency assumes the worst. And so you have to give them that info. Um, and so I'm gonna wrap this up and I'm, we're happy to field questions on this. What the standards are for media matter greatly to where you can place this stuff. And so you always have to keep that in the back of your mind. Um, Lance, if you want to go to the next one, I'm going to skim through these pretty quickly. 
This is an upland, on the left is an upland containment area. So the containment in the red, uh, you have an area for water to drain off and then you actually have water uh, to hold on site because as Sally talked about earlier, there's water with this stuff and you can't just discharge that water anywhere. It needs to stay on your site. Uh, on the right, that's the Houston Galveston district. That's a, a, a DMPA. Um, they're building that island basically at the end of the peninsula. Uh, Lance goes to the next one. I know this is a federal project. I know, I know, but it's really cool. Talk about the recycling side of the world. So those red things are DMPAs in the area. Um, if you flip one more, Lance, um, they identified this huge sand source at the mouth of the Galveston Houston district. And they use that sand source after, I'm sure, unlimited testing here, right? We're, we're exposing marine acute, we're exposing humans, we're exposing um, the tidal zones, um, but they use that sand source to replenish a beach on Galveston Bay. And so while I realize that it's federal money and federal placement, there are also cool things or, or interesting things, innovative things like that that you could do on your site too if you have the data to support it. I'm going to let that. Yeah, we'll just uh, kind of go through this quickly. We've been mentioning it along the way, but the city and the community will get involved at some point, most likely, and it's better to engage them early on. Um, I mean by that that public notice is most likely going to be required through either your air permit or your wastewater permit and that will be a surprise for your community if you haven't engaged them previously and a lot of people don't like to know that a giant chemical plant is going to be placed in their neighborhood for example and they didn't know anything about it and they had no say about it so they're going to have some protests have public comment maybe request public hearings and drag your permitting process out. So it's important to engage the community early on, develop some sort of community action plan. Um, we've done those in the past and worked with both the community, the state agencies, and the local permitting authorities to all come together for everybody to get on the same page to seamlessly move forward with your facility construction. Um, you can even engage the city early on to have the, the city or county or whatever your jurisdiction is to have them assist you with siting. They likely have an idea or a group of people internally that monitor these things because they want to increase their, uh, you know, city profit. They want more industry in and they likely have ideas of spaces that are available and even some history on those sites. So you can work with them to help you find your spot, your new facility location. And if you engage in the community early on, they can be part of that, they can feel like they're part of the process with you and be more likely to accept it and understand that it will help them, it'll help their city and their community, it'll increase jobs and be for the betterment of the entire community. We'll just uh, wrap up one last item to consider. We have these services here at, at Braun and um, there, there's something to include at your project. You'll want to make sure that where, where you've decided to site based on all your considerations for dredging, for permitting, all your surveys that you've completed, your city and community involvement. Once you've found your site, you want to make sure that what you are going to be building on has the right integrity for what you plan to build. If you're going to be putting some massive tanks, you want to be able to ensure that that, that material below you is going to be able to withstand or how it needs to be fortified so it can close the services that you need to provide for your it, customers. This is where you can get back into if that material is reusable on site. So if you have um, evaluation criteria there that can be done by our engineering and testing group um, through different mechanisms, whether it's reuse of, of soils or whether it's deeper mm -hmm. foundations to allow the reuse of soils. So um, Lance, it's all yours from there. Okay. 
Well, we are running a little bit out of time, so we're going to save the questions. I'm going to uh, send the questions to uh, the panel, and they'll get back with you as soon as possible. Um, here's some information about Braun Intertech and how we're expanding um, through the Midwest and the South. And also, here's our contact information for our panel. And if you have any questions, you can actually reach out directly to them as well. Um, our next webinar is Minimizing Risk and Controlling Exposures with Industrial Hygiene. And uh, Sally, are you going to be on that one too, or are we going to give you a break this time? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to give you guys a break for me. <laughs> I know my fans will be disappointed. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, uh, thank my panel for uh, for being with us. This is it takes a lot of work to put these things together, and it's not their uh, sometimes it's not their favorite thing to do. But uh, great webinar. Thank you, Andy, Sally, and Austin. All right, thank, thank you, everyone. Guys, thanks, Lance. Thanks, Lance. Thanks, Lance. Thanks, everybody. Okay, have, have a great a good day. day.